Welcome everyone. This is Jordan and I'm the worship pastor here at Trevecca Community Church. And we are so glad that you're here with us today as we hear God's word. Each week we stream the service live from the sanctuary just for you. So come along with us now as we grow together and hear what God has to say to us. Uh, and here in a moment, uh, we will have our uh, Faith Promise uh, sermon, our missions message for today with a special guest, Dr. Danny Gomes. And uh, he'll come up here shortly um, after we hear the word of the Lord, the scripture passage for this morning. Uh, but before we hear the scripture passage, um, I have the opportunity to uh, introduce you to Dr. Gomes. Dr. Daniel Gomes is the regional director of the Africa region for the Church of the Nazarene. Danny is from Senegal, where he grew up as the son of a famous journalist. He first accepted Christ in 1995 and was mentored as a young man by a lay Nazarene pastor from Cape Verde and later by Nazarene missionaries throughout Africa. He has since gone on to mentor many other leaders through his work in West Africa. Danny began leading a congregation as lay pastor in 2003 while also serving the church in an essential role as French translator. He served as president of the Evangelical Youth of Senegal as well. Through l'Université Gaston Berger, sorry, Pastor Danny, I know I didn't say that right, uh, the university he went to in Senegal, he completed his undergraduate studies in African literature and civilization and a teaching certificate in Wolof. He went on to earn a Master of Divinity from Nazarene Theological Seminary in Kansas City in the United States, and in May 2019, he received his honorary doctorate from Southern Nazarene University here in the United States. Danny is married to Anneli and the father to four daughters. In 2011, he was ordained as elder and has led the church in the roles of pastor, district superintendent in Senegal, and field strategy coordinator across all of West Africa for the Church of the Nazarene. He has also served as Africa Westfield Literature and Education Coordinator and a member of the French Literature Advisory Committee. Currently, He's the regional director for the Church of the Nazarene for Africa. Beyond the church, Danny has worked for the International Organization for Migration, working towards a more humane and orderly migration of people. His passion is ministry. His passion in ministry is to see communities transformed by Christ-like disciples who will bring peace, healing, and restoration in every community and nation of Africa through the values of authenticity, presence, relevance, and interdependence. Danny enjoys reading listening to music, watching football, the real football, not the American one, and learning about new cultures and meeting new people. In 2021, Dr. Gomes co-authored with Dr. Carla Sundberg the book, Color, God's Intention for Diversity. Uh, and on a personal note, I uh, greatly appreciate Dr. Gomes. Uh, he was our boss when Ritu and I and Zane served as missionaries in West Africa and count him both a friend and a mentor uh, who is not only a great leader in the church of the Nazarene and in the church globally, but more importantly is a faithful follower and son of Christ. And so I'm going to invite Salama to come up and read the passage and then we look forward together to hear from Dr. Gomes this morning. Thanks be to God. Hear now the word of the Lord. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord for the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Salam alaikum. You can say alaikum salam. Uh, bonjour. Good morning. Thank you uh, for having me here. I'm uh, blessed to be with you this morning. I've been blessed since I've been here on Friday. I saw God moving here in my different encounters with people. So thank you for having me. And this is like also home for me because there are many people here that I know 
and whose children have, are serving with me in Africa, but also you have uh, Jeremy and Ritu, who also we served with us in Africa. So thank you for trusting us with your children, trusting God too with your children. It is a blessing for me to be here this morning, and uh, as I've been praying for every year, when the year starts, I pray God and I ask God, what are you seeing? Lord, what are you hearing? And I listen to him, and he speaks to me. And the Lord gave me these words from the book of Matthew chapter 9. The Bible says that Jesus was going through the cities, to the towns and villages, and he was teaching, and he was proclaiming the good news, and he was healing every disease and sickness. And when I was reading this, in January, it was also a time in a country where I live, Côte d'Ivoire, people call it also Ivory Coast, in Abidjan, and uh, there was what we call the African Cup of Nations. Anyone here likes football? Not American football. Right? I'm talking about football, you call it soccer. Everybody here likes soccer, yes? All right, yeah, in fact, in fact just uh, 10 days ago, we ended in Africa what we call the African Cup of Nations. It is like 24 countries of Africa coming together for one month, and then at the end, then one, one country will win. It's so big, it's so huge, you cannot imagine if you are not there. In fact, there is so much passion, nations fighting against each other, like teasing each other, it's really exciting. And uh, we just came out of that, and uh, the country where we live, Cote d'Ivoire, won the African Cup of Nations. Can you imagine? <laughs> it was amazing, it was amazing. And, and uh, I went through different emotions because my country won before that. So I didn't know what to think, but God reminded me that he, he sanctified me. So uh, I had to tell to my brothers and sisters, congratulations, this is about Africa. <laughs> Amen. You know, when you have an African Cup of Nations, I think it's also true for even the Super Bowl. I don't know much about American football, but I love the way, you know, the thing that they are wearing is just beautiful. You know, I just like it, and I like the strategy. I love it. But one of the most important moments in the pre preparation of the African Cup of Nations, or in every like a big sport, sport event, when a country is playing, is the selection of the players. Like, we will represent the country. That's important. It is because that's the national coach, the one who is coaching the team, national team, and his team, what they do for one or two years, they scout. They go around and they watch their players from the country playing in other countries. So they can see who among those they can select. What they go, they go in, the tr in their clubs, they discuss with their coaches, and they finally decide who fits and who is ready to represent, to be selecting for the, selected for the competition. And uh, we are doing it as human beings. And my question is, do you think God also selects people for his team? Do you believe God does that? I think that's what I saw here in the book of Matthew chapter 9 when I was reading it. And there are things that I saw here that brought my attention, that caught my attention. The Bible says that the first thing the Bible says is that Jesus went to all the times of villages and the verse says he saw the crowds. He saw the crowds. I don't know about you, but we men, me as a man, I see things differently than my, my wife. We can watch a movie and I will see the whole scenario of the movie, and at some point she will turn to me and say, did you see the curtains in the movie? I said, what are you talking about? She, would, she could see the whole scenario, at the same time, she can see the details. So she has a different perspective than mine. What about God? Jesus, the Bible says, he saw the crowd. He saw a crowd, but he defined them. He said they were harassed and helpless, 
like sheep without a shepherd. That's what Jesus saw. He assessed the situation. He sees people who are harassed, people who are helpless, people who are like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus, that's what he saw. And I was asking to myself as I was walking around, traveling in Africa, Jesus, where can I see that? Where do I see in Africa people who are harassed, people who are, people who are tired, people who are oppressed, people who are suffering, people who are taking blows. In fact, the word that is used here is, in Greek is a very strong word. It's like someone that you take and you throw on the ground. It is very violent. So Jesus is seeing people who are completely down. That's what he sees. And I, and I was thinking, what can it look like? And if I go to Africa with you, if we go to Africa together, and we go to one country that is called DR Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, and you go to the eastern part of that country. In fact, there is a place there that is called North Kivu. And in that part, there is a place that is called Goma. In North Kivu, the Norwegian Refugee Council, what they do every year, they identify the world's most neglected crisis. The, mo the world most neglected crisis. Every year, they identify them. And in 2022, they made a list. Right when the Ukraine war started, they made a list of the countries where there are wars or crises that are neglected. And guess what? Out of the 10 countries that they listed, eight, seven were in Africa. Seven were in Africa, and three were in South America. And one of the countries that have been in that list for years was DRC Congo. Maybe many people here don't know what is happening in DRC Congo. But if you Google just Goma today, you will see that there are people who have been into a civil war for more than 15 years. You will see that there are 5.7 million people who have been displaced. You will see that at some point, the United Nations was calling that part of Congo the capital of rape in the world. Because rape was used by the rebels as a weapon against the women. That's what is happening still today there. And I believe, because I met some of those. I was in that place last year. I met a young boy. His name was Grace. I met him, and I saw his smile. He's living in those camps. And he came and he spent time together. When I looked at him, I gave him a small thing. But the smiles I saw in his eyes. He lost both of his parents who were killed. He's raised by a grandmother. But I saw hope in his eyes. But I saw what Jesus saw. I understood what it is to see people who are harassed. My friends, it's not just in Goma. Here in this country, I heard about those young people who go in those, uh, I don't know if you call it, where they drink uh, in the street and you drive. I saw them first in Indianapolis. They will be driving, you know, and cycling and drinking. And I was like, what is this? You know, and that's strange. But, you know, they look happy. But they are not happy. They are distressed. They are the same people that Jesus is talking about here. So the first thing Jesus sees, he sees their situation. And the Bible says, when he saw the crowd, he had compassion. Compassion. You know, in Africa, what we do sometimes when we pray, when we preach, when I say the word that I want to emphasize, I will ask you to repeat that word. Can we do that? Can you repeat with me? Compassion. Compassion. Jesus had compassion on them. The Lord Jesus was motivated by love. What he saw is people suffering and he had compassion for them. He was like a father looking at children. He was like a mother looking at her baby. He saw them. They were tired. They were harassed. They were exhausted. They were exploited. They were badly treated. They were beaten. They were suffering. They were taking blood. That's what is happening in many places with young people in Africa. And not just in Africa. In many places. They have no hope. 
That's what Jesus is saying. But the Bible says Jesus sees that, sees that. Then he turns to his disciples and he makes just a statement. He said, he makes an assessment. He said, okay, you know what? The harvest is plentiful. Can you say with me, harvest? I mean, do you know what is a harvest? Is it positive a harvest? Yes. But what he's seeing, is it positive? What the reality is bleak. The reality is not something that is nice. People are being harassed. People are oppressed. But Jesus, he sees that. But what he says, his interpretation is that the harvest is plentiful. Hallelujah. Do you see what Jesus is saying? Do you see what Jesus is saying? You can be in our countries and see the situation is bleak. But Jesus doesn't see what we see. Jesus doesn't see what we think that is the reality. He doesn't deny the reality. No. But he says, I see harvest. I see potential. I see hope. That's what Jesus is saying here. And I was like, Jesus, how can you see that? Because our God... This morning I was listening to a song I was talking about the grace of God and I had tears in my eyes because it reminded me 25 years ago when I was like that I was harassed I was into drugs I was one of the bad guys of my university Gaston Berger I was one of the bad guys from outside I was a bad guy and People were avoiding me. We had a group of people. But you know, I was like that story in the Bible, and I would invite you to, because that's an important story, is the story of those two sons. You remember that story of two sons when Jesus said that the first son, the father calls him and say, uh, go and do this. He said, no, then he kind of regretted, repented, and he went. And the second son say, yes. Then he didn't go. You know that story. It's in Matthew. I was that one who said to God, from outside, everything in me said no to God. Everything in me. When you would see me, and I can show you a picture of me. I won't do it, but I, I could. In those days, you would never thought that this guy had anything with God, to do with God. I was from outside a very bad guy. I was the guy that was going with a group of people no one knew. But people inside, my outside was saying no. My mouth was saying no. But my heart was saying yes to God. My mouth was saying no to God. But my heart was saying yes to God. Jesus, when he saw that crowd, he saw so many. From outside, they are saying no. From, from their heart, they are saying yes to God. And I can tell you that there are others who are sitting here. Their mouth is saying yes, but their heart is saying no to God. Jesus is talking about this here. That's why he said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You know, the problem is, Jesus is talking about the harvest, right? Which means that the harvest is ready, he said. He has already prepared the hearts and he's inviting us to join him in the harvesting. Then he says, but the workers are few. In those days, I was not a worker of Jesus, but my heart loved Jesus. I won't go into details into that. But I can tell you that when I looked at it and I preached in some places, I asked people, do you think we have enough workers in the church, in the church in Africa, just all over the church, all the churches? They say, oh yeah, yeah. But if you come to Côte d'Ivoire, I tell you, you will see billboards of apostles, bishops, I mean, you name it. They are all over. On Sundays, there are thousands and thousands of churches. You go to some places like Ghana, you can get in a whole street. You know, one house is a house, next is a church. One is a house, next is a church. That's the reality. So there are a lot of workers. But Jesus is saying the workers are few. Why? Is it still true today? I heard Dr. Carla Sundberg 
my dear friend, once she said, we don't have a harvest problem. We have a laborer problem. We, the church, don't have a harvest problem. America is ready. Africa is ready. The problem is not the crowd. The problem is the workers, the harvesters. The problem is not the readiness of the hearts. The readiness of the harvest, that's not the problem. The problem is the availability of the harvesters. When Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, that's what he meant. He was talking about not only the quantity of workers, but the quality of those workers. Because among those workers, there were those who say no with their mouth, but their heart is saying yes. Those that are not even working. But there are those many who said yes with their mouth, but their heart is saying no. And they are still working for the kingdom. But in fact, they are not working for the kingdom. They are working for their own kingdom. That's the problem of the church. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's what Jesus talked to me and convicted me about. Are you building your kingdom? God is not about promoting people up. He told me. God is not about that. God is not promoting people up. God is promoting this way. Hallelujah. This way. He doesn't promote this way. He promotes this way. What does it mean? I asked God. He said, you know, when I give you a new responsibility, I'm not like giving you so you can have titles. I am enlarging you so whatever I taught you, you can share it with others. That's why we're talking about gifts. Our spiritual gifts are what? Gifts. What is a gift made for? To give away. But our gift becomes our way of influencing people, our way of manipulating people, our way of controlling people. Let me tell you this. You know, witchcraft, witchcraft is two things. To dominate and to manipulate for one purpose, to control. That's witchcraft. So do we have witchcraft in the church? Yes. Yes. Because if we manipulate and we try to dominate, when someone is strong spiritually, we try to manipulate that person. When someone is weak spiritually, we dominate that person. But the end is the same, is for control. Jesus didn't call us for that. That's why he said the workers are few. So my friends, there is a twofold problem. And I want to talk to those like me years ago with their mouth who said yes. Who said no, sorry. And their heart said yes. You know yourself. We know each other. Many believers who should be working in the harvest field are not. And many of those who are working are not doing a very good job. Some are in the harvest, they are sabotating God's work. And I saw it in so many places. That's just the reality. The entire world is ripe for the kingdom of God. But we are the citizens and the children and the representative of the Most High. And are we failing in our responsibility to bring in the harvest? Are we failing? Are we failing? And then Jesus, when he said that, then he said, you know, the harvest is ready, it's plentiful, the workers are few. Are few. And, the, and the disciples were looking at him and said, so? Jesus said, I'm not asking you to go and work on your elections and choose the people that you want. No. What I'm asking you is this. He said, pray. Pray. The Ask the Lord of the harvest. Ask the Lord of the harvest. Therefore, to send out workers into his harvest. Whose harvest is it? Is it? Our harvest? It's his harvest. He knows 
what kind of workers he needs for that season, what skills he needs, what character he needs. He knows it. So before you preach, before you, 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 you vote, or before you choose, or select as a pastor, or me as a music director, God taught me, before you do anything, ask me. Lord, whatever position it is, ask me. Lord, you, asked, you said that I should ask you to send workers because this is your harvest. That's your work. I'm just your co-laborer. So Lord, what should I do? Speak to me. And the Lord will speak to you. Maybe that's what we should do in the church when we do elections. First thing we do, we ask him, Lord, who do you want? What is our task as a church? What is the task of the church today? The task of the church is simple. The Bible says simply the, to, to ask the Father to send out workers into his harvest field. Is that complicated? Can we do that? Can we just say, Lord, send workers in your harvest? Can you say that together? Lord, send workers in your harvest. Is that complicated? But how many times do we say that prayer? Maybe we never say it. But that's what Jesus is saying. That's what Jesus is asking us to do. And my prayer today, my prayer every day when I travel, because, you know, there is nothing worse than having the wrong people at some places. Nothing worse. And one of the most difficult things in leadership is to choose the right person. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. The church needs the Holy Spirit. I will share with this you, share this with you. The real issue that I see in most cases is that Christianity has been spiritualized, individualized, privatized, and domesticated to only become a preparation for being good getting instant, instant blessings, or for getting ready for the rapture. That's not what, why we are here. Jesus didn't come for us to just say, Jesus, I'm ready, take me. Right. No, we are here to prepare the kingdom right. for his coming. Right. We have work to do here on earth. We are not saved to fly. We are not saved to fly. We are saved to thrive and to increase God's kingdom on earth. That's the prayer that I have for us. And it's not just for Africa. Because people think, uh, people, oh, Africa, but Africa has also issues. It's, it's us in us, like we say. It's, and we are all in the same boat. But we have the same Lord Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I will invite you now to stand and we'll, we'll just, I will just ask you something simple. Very simple. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And he said, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And in this room, in this church, I know some like me said, were saying no from outside, but inside their heart was saying yes. I know what it is. I know what it is. And sometimes they look from outside, you would never think that even those people that you see in those bicycles drinking, some of them, their heart is saying yes to God. Many of them, maybe next door, I, I, when I drove here last time, with Jeremy, I saw that guy with his bottle crossing the road. Maybe his heart is saying yes to God and his mouth is saying no. Or are we just staying inside the church? Have we been called to just stay inside the church? Jesus called us for his kingdom. His kingdom is in the business place. His kingdom is in the university. His kingdom is every sphere of the society he wants us to have an impact that's what he's calling us to do 
But we want to just gather together, have our own fun, and just wait for Jesus to come back. That's not what he called us for. So my prayer is for you who is standing. If you know, like me at some point, that your mouth has been saying no, but your heart is saying yes, this is the day for you. This is the day for you. <laughs> He's the same. I know what I'm talking about. He met me when I was about to convert to Islam. Jesus met me. <laughs> so I'm not talking about just books. It's the reality. Jesus is real. And he's here today. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Yes. So wherever you are, God knows you. Just bow your head. And just say, Jesus, I confess. That my mouth has been saying no to you. But today, you know that my heart has been saying yes to you for a long time. But today, I want my mouth and my heart to join together. And say, come Jesus, and may your will be done. Say, Jesus, join my mouth and my heart. Come, Jesus, may your will be done. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. Remember, you can join us in person in the sanctuary at 1030 a.m. on Sunday mornings, live on YouTube or through our sermon podcast. If you'd like to give, you can do so at trevecachurch slash give. Any other ministry resources can be found on our website. However you join us, however you choose to engage, know that you are loved. We're grateful for you.